presidential pardon. Here's NBC News correspondent Douglas Kiker. Good evening. Article 2 of the Constitution of the United States of America gives the president the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States. Today, in a move which caught just about everybody by surprise, President Ford used this constitutional provision to make the most controversial decision he has made since assuming office just one month ago tomorrow. And that is how the nation learned the shocking news exactly 40 years ago, 49 years ago tonight. The 38th president of the United States, Gerald Ford, had pardoned the 37th president of the United States, Richard Nixon, for any potential crimes he committed during Watergate. Now, therefore, I, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States, pursuant to the pardon power conferred upon me by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, have granted, and by these presents do grant, a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon for all offenses against the United States which he, Richard Nixon, has committed or may have committed or taken part in during the period from July 20, 1969 through August 9, 1974. After that portion of his Oval Office speech, President Ford signed the pardon of Richard Nixon on camera for the entire nation to see. During that speech, President Ford admitted he could find, quote, no historic or legal precedents to justify the pardon. Instead, he repeatedly invoked mercy for Richard Nixon, saying he wanted to help the nation, quote, after years of bitter controversy and divisive national debate. And that is largely how that moment in presidential history is remembered, a moment of mercy from a benevolent leader and a nation ready to move on from the shame of the Watergate scandal. But let's go back to that NBC News report again. How was the news of, the, of Nixon's pardon actually greeted on that day? The White House switchboard was flooded with phone calls all day today, and the White House said most of the calls were angry, heavy, and constant, and generally condemned the pardon. A Gallup poll taken the very weekend Nixon was pardoned by President Ford found that 58 percent of Americans wanted Richard Nixon to face trial for Watergate. Joining us now, Jill Weinbanks, who, who served as an assistant Watergate prosecutor. She is the co-host of the pod, Hashtag Sisters in Law podcast and an MSNBC legal analyst. And Michael Beschloss, NBC News presidential historian and the author of numerous presidential biographies. Great to see you both, Jill. The, par the pardon of Nixon has clear parallels to Donald Trump now facing 91 counts on four different indictments in four different jurisdictions. But you know the drill. Let's listen to something else President Ford said 49 years ago today. After years of bitter controversy and divisive national debate, I have been advised and I am compelled to conclude that many months and perhaps more years will have to pass before Richard Nixon could obtain a fair trial by jury in any jurisdiction of the United States under governing decisions of the Supreme Court. Jill, doesn't that sound a lot like what we hear from Donald Trump? It does, and it wasn't true then, and it's not true now. There is a way to have a free and fair trial because jurors are asked whether they can make a decision based on the evidence in the courtroom and put aside their preconceived notions. And jurors do that all the time. I felt that Richard Nixon should have been indicted. There were rumors back then that it was a deal between Ford and Nixon, that he would take over the presidency uh, and agree to pardon Nixon. There were also rumors that there was a deal between Ford and Leon Jaworski, who by then had replaced Archie Cox as a special prosecutor. I've come to believe that Ford acted out of his own concept of what was fair and just and because he felt pity for Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. 
but he also made sure that Nixon admitted his guilt when he accepted the pardon. He made sure that a case called Burdick v. U.S., which says basically when you accept a pardon, you are admitting your guilt, that that was hand-carried to him by the lawyer he sent to offer the pardon. And it was a very touching scene uh, when I heard the description of the presentation of the pardon along with the Supreme Court case. And mm. it's very touching, but it's still wrong. It is wrong, and we wouldn't be where we are today if there had been a fair trial where people could, and in Georgia, you can see the trial. Hopefully, there will be um, an amendment to the rules to allow it in federal court, because I think seeing the trial would change the minds of many, many citizens. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, then why do you think all these years later the truth about Nixon's pardon is misremembered? How does it play into our understanding of the Trump indictment? Well, I think what happened is that as long as a president did not do things that not only could have gotten him impeached and convicted, but uh, indicted and tried as uh, Donald Trump is right now uh, and, you know, for indictments plus and counting, uh, that would have been fine. But the objection that was raised at the time to Ford's pardon was, if you give Nixon a pardon after doing things that people like Joe Weinbanks and Leo, Leon Jaworski felt could have sent him to prison, then you're basically saying to every future president, whatever you do in office, it's a, cri it's a free crime zone. Do what you want. You'll be pardoned on the Nixon precedent, and the worst that will happen to, be, to you will be you, you'll be going back to your seaside villa, either in San Clemente or in Palm Beach. I think if Nixon had at least been indicted, fingerprinted, and had that mugshot, someone like Donald Trump might have said when he was doing bad things, that could happen to me. I'd better be a little bit more careful. Never happened to the tragedy of the country. Congresswoman Moore, your reaction to the Wisconsin Republican Party coalescing around this idea to impeach Judge Protasiewicz? Oh my God, Jonathan! I thought when we I thought when we beat them by eleven points uh, that we had won, and I just think it's nefarious. I think it's cynical. Um, I've had a dozen people at least ask me what Janet Protasiewicz has done wrong. That's the point. Nothing. She's done nothing except to have won this election. And, you know, there are no simple solutions because uh, uh, if they impeach her in the House, uh, the state Senate simply doesn't have to take it up. And if they don't take it up, mm -hmm. she automatically will not be able to sit and hear any cases, uh, not just the abortion case, but, of course, the redistricting case. Um, and uh, uh, the governor won't have the power to reappoint anyone. Uh, and uh, they know that she hasn't done anything wrong. They know mm -hmm. that they don't have any cause. Uh, it, it certainly is a slap in the face of the purpose uh, of an impeachment. Uh, well, and, um, and they don't care. They're just saying right. the stuff that they're just saying it out loud. We're going to do it because we want to maintain this gerrymandered map, and we want to keep this 1849 ban on abortion. Well, th well to your point, Congresswoman Moore, um, uh, Ben, I'm coming to you, because Michelle Goldberg from The New York Times brought up something that Congresswoman Moore just said, and I'm going to read from, from the op-ed. Some observers think that even if Republicans impeach Protestantes, they have no intention of actually holding a Senate trial. Once impeached, a justice is suspended from hearing cases while the process plays out. But since the state constitution is silent on a timeline for that process, Republicans could impeach Protestantes and then leave her in legal oblivion indefinitely. Uh, ben, you've said this could even provoke a constitutional crisis. How dangerous would her impeachment be? This impeachment threat by itself to me is a constitutional crisis, and an actual impeachment would be a massive rip in the fabric of our constitutional democracy. 
because in our system of government, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or hate politics or an independent, you know that there's co-equal branches of government. There's an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. And you're not supposed to have a legislature just rip away, throw out elected Supreme Court justices in a state to stop them from making a ruling that you don't like. So the, the idea that they would use this kind of loophole in the Constitution, the framers didn't think people would use impeachment powers in bad faith. The idea that they would use that loophole to suspend a Supreme Court justice to stop her from doing her job. That was never contemplated. And the only remedy now is a massive public outcry that shames Republican legislators and makes them think about whether they would like to be reelected in the future to the point where they back off this unconstitutional threat. And Ben, more to the point, I think a lot of people say when they think of judges um, and particularly Supreme Court, their minds probably go to the United States Supreme Court, where those people are appointed and they get lifetime appointment appointments. What you're talking about is a Supreme Court justice who wasn't appointed. She was elected by the people. That adds to the, the constitutional crisis that you're talking about. It's not just the, you know, dethroning a, a Supreme Court justice. It's defying the will of the people. That's exactly it. It would nullify the votes of a million voters. We had a record high turnout. And we're a 50-50 state. Janet Protosiewicz won by an 11-point landslide. You don't see that very often in a state like Wisconsin. So these Republicans, they're really playing with fire in a dynamite factory. They're saying to voters that if they vote for someone who those politicians don't like, the politicians will just undo the election decisions that the voters made. But the voters ultimately are in charge. And frankly, I, I think a lot of these Republicans know in their hearts that this is not only wrong, but it's dangerous. It's something neither side should ever be contemplating to nullify an election for partisan for political gain. And my, my deep, sincere hope is that enough of them uh, say to the Republican Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, cut this out, that they back away from the brink and we don't have the kind of constitutional crisis that would threaten every elected judge in the country who then would have to worry that legislators might throw them out of office or suspend them from office if they don't like the judicial rulings that they, in good faith, plan to make in the future. Mm -hmm. Ben, let me ask you w one more question, because th this possible impeachment could energize Wisconsin voters once again. And according to The New York Times, 12 Republicans in the Wisconsin Assembly and six in the state Senate come from districts, Judge Protosiewicz won. So what's the feeling on the ground there? Could there be voter backlash over this? You're calling for it, but will it happen? It's already happening. I can tell you, I've been on Zooms with hundreds of volunteers and activists from Republican legislative districts multiple times this week. People have been knocking on doors in those legislative districts that you just named and many others. Night after night, they'll be out there tomorrow. Anyone who wants to get involved can go to defendjustice.com. People are flooding them with phone calls. They're calling and texting voters in those districts to let them know that their legislators are thinking about throwing out their last votes. And today we had our first Republican in the state assembly come out publicly and say that he was going to vote no on impeachment if it came up. And he said that impeachment should not be used for political gain. So there are cracks in the dam. I don't think this is a mm -hmm. foregone conclusion, although some in Wisconsin think it is. I think the, the there's a, a real chance of the blowback coming in so strong that they back off. Uh, Congresswoman Moore, Republicans who are working to subvert elections have zero deniability uh, after Trump 2020 and January 6th. There's no pretending here. There's no pretending. So from your lips to God's ears, Ben, that they're going to just suddenly feel ashamed uh, and back off. Uh, and, you know, if, if that's where we're at, I think we have to listen to people like John Lewis, our, our ancestors, say, pray with your feet. So we have got to continue this action. We got to use legal action, political participation, everything. But I don't think that they're too ashamed to do it. Um, you know, um, you know, they haven't won a presidential election in this country uh, since 1992. They haven't won the popular vote. Republicans know that they're with our coalition, our very strong coalition of voters, that we have outnumbered them. And the only way for them to stay in power is to cheat. Uh, and that is why the, the, they, they don't feel any shame with Donald mm -hmm. Trump. 
because he's a liar, he's a cheat, and that's just fine with them because mm -hmm. it means that they get to stay in power. Here we are in a state where we have super majorities in the state assembly uh, and super majority uh, in the state senate, um, and, and we're a 50-50 state, um, and yet as soon as those redistricting lawsuits were brought forward, Republicans came up with this scheme. What, there's mm -hmm. an existential threat that democracy will subvert their effort to stay in power. And so, and I, you know, I'm not sure that they're going to be ashamed. Right. Well, they've shown that they're not really that ashamed. But uh, Congressman Moore, at the national level, when it comes to abortion, all they want to do is just try to change the name. There's reporting that Senate Republicans held a closed door meeting on Capitol Hill to find a new term for pro-life amid crushing electoral defeats over abortion. My question to you, Congresswoman, will it work? Well, I tell you, pro-life has worked for so long, and I have begrudged them that uh you know, that nomenclature for that long, because none of them are pro-life. You know, uh, they're, they're, they're pro-forcing uh, a birth on women, because once that child comes out, um, all women uh, see is the disgust and the, the, them voting against food stamps. Right now in the farm bill, when we go back, We've got to fight to keep them from stripping fruits and vegetable benefits from poor babies and children who are on WIC. So I don't want to hear about how pro-life they are. It's about time they got rid of that lie in their name. I wish them a luck in finding a new name, although we know what it is. It's denying women their human rights.